The, the challenge is a 3,000 mile rowing race from the Canary Islands across to the Caribbean. It's a rowing race, so there's no sails, motors, engines. It's completely, you know, man power alone or woman power alone. There's no kind of support. You can't get any outside help. You're on your own pretty much from A to B. And the only way to get there is by, is by rowing yourself across. Typically, it takes teams kind of three or four months to get across, depending on the weather conditions. Teams normally encounter big storms, so kind of 10, 12 meter waves, kind of waves as high as a three story house, 60, 70, 80 mile an hour winds. It's not uncommon for teams to capsize. Teams have had to get rescued in the past, where they're kind of stranded in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of a storm for a couple of days. On the way back from work, phoned three of my oldest mates and said, look, I've always been wanting to do this. It's always been in kind of my periphery. Are you up for it? Phoned them all that car journey. And uh, yeah, a week later, we were all uh, all in my flat trying to decide on team names, plan of attack, strategy, etc. So um, yeah, I can kind of uh, take responsibility for that one. It really became real for me when we took delivery of our ocean rowing boat. And you know, the, the kind of the space you're living in, sleeping in, rowing in, going to the toilet in, trying to eat in, is about eight square meters. So when we got this boat, it kind of really hit home that actually, this is a pretty tight space. This is going to be home for at least a month. You know, the, the physical training is, is probably a lot more obvious than the mental preparation. And one of the kind of strategies we had, we'd work with a few sports psychologists leading up to the race. And they said, look, if, if you have a physical injury, if you, if you break your arm, if you cut yourself, if you have some terrible blisters, that's going to be quite obvious. The rest of the team are going to see that and they're going to recognise you're injured and they're going to be there to help you and support you. And that's great. But if you're mentally really struggling, that might not be obvious to the other team members. You know, if you're really having a bad day, if you're really fed up, if mentally you're in a really bad place, unless you speak to the other team members about that, they're not going to be able to, to help you. They're not going to notice that. So one of the kind of strategies we had going into the race is that if we were struggling mentally, we'd, we'd, we'd let the team members know and that way everyone could support each other. It's quite sometimes quite hard to articulate to the, to, to the average person in terms of what you have to do to transform your body from probably literally being an office worker to then transitioning to being at sea for over 30 days. It was a two year journey and we kind of started off kind of in the gym. That was where we kind of started off the physical training. Obviously, there's lots of things that go into, uh, into that. You've got flexibility, mobility, strength, conditioning, anaerobic, aerobic, etc. So we had a really kind of clear plan and really structured plan, but we, we broke it down into kind of month chunks. So yeah, from a physical perspective, we need to get strong. We all need to get heavier and we all put on about 15 to 20 kilos in the lead up to that race. We then needed to learn how to how to row because the reality is we had never rowed before. We barely sat on one of those rowing machines in the gym. So we had to join a rowing club um, and that's exactly what we did. And then obviously you transition from the gym to the river and eventually, I think it was start of 2019, we got our ocean rowing boat and that's where we started to put in the real hours. Some people just couldn't fathom it. They just kind of like, just don't get how someone can, how a team can survive that long at sea. So they just kind of don't, then kind of grasp the whole concept of it and they kind of ask the question like why are you doing this and they're obviously wired very differently to how we were and then you also had kind of there's almost three camps you had those guys who had the really positive people saying love it push yourself like out of your comfort zone like god i'm jealous i wish i could do this you also had these kind of naysayers who are a bit like well you've never rode before you kind of you're not a professional athlete you've got a full-time job and I think for us, obviously, you take the energy where you can, which is positive, but even the people who are negative, you kind of almost flip that into a positive and you want to kind of prove them wrong. So what if you're not good at it? Just try, like you're only going to improve and you're only going to learn. We were at the star line with 40 other teams. You know, the excitement, the fear, the apprehension is kind of overwhelming, really. And, you know, we knew that once we pushed off from La Gomera, the wind and the waves are pushing you out to sea. So there's no turning back. Once you release those lines and you take those first couple of strokes out and you get past the harbour wall, that's it. You can't turn back because you're getting swept out to sea. 
So that was quite a sobering thought. So look, you find yourself literally after two years of all this training, all this prep, all this routine, you find yourself at the start line. You get off that, that ferry from mainland to Lagomera and you suddenly meet all your competition. And in the year we were racing there with 40 boats uh, or just under. And you suddenly see everyone and you start seeing, all right, what have they done to their boat? What kit are they having? How big are they? And it starts, you suddenly enter this kind of competitive world. You're not just in your bubble, you're in a bigger bubble now. You have 10 days on shore before you kind of push off. Um, so we arrived on the 2nd of December, we pushed off on the 12th. And for those 10 days, it was really, it was really odd. And the kind of couple of days before the race, obviously we'd fine tuned our boat, we'd taken out for a practice run. But a few days before, it kind of suddenly, it, this kind of wall of emotion, which I'd never felt before ever, kind of just was was overpowering and I felt one end of the spectrum, like one minute I'd be excited, I'd be ready to go, kind of pumped, full of adrenaline. The next I'd be like beyond anxious and I don't normally suffer from anxiety, but I'd be kind of doubting myself, wondering like, can I do this? Didn't really, you know, didn't want to talk to anyone, couldn't eat, couldn't sleep. As Tom said earlier, we work, we work with a sports psychologist and it took me the, literally the night before I phoned him up and said, look, Andy, I'm not feeling myself. Like, can we just have a chat? And I explained how I was feeling, my emotions. I was completely transparent. And he said, look, what this is, is this is something called your chimp. And I kind of said, well, what do you mean your chimp? And he started articulating to me about the chimp paradox, which is written by Professor Steve Peters. And he explains basically the chimp is this small part in your brain, which is there. It's about the size of a nut and it is designed to keep you safe. So it kind of protects you from going down dark alleys. It protects you from doing kind of stupid stuff. And I was about to probably do the most crazy thing that I've ever done, rode 3,000 miles. And my chimp was just like in overdrive. It was like, Ollie, do not do this. Like, you're gonna let down your teammates. You're gonna embarrass yourself. Like, it's dangerous. People die during this, just stop, yeah? And it was just on alert and I couldn't, it was just overpowering all of my thoughts. So literally for two hours, we spoke about it. We, we kind of understood it and, and we named it. So we named my chimp, we named it a, a guy called Nigel. But what it did, it helped me control these negative thoughts in my head, which made the whole situation more and my anxiety more manageable because I knew that these feelings I were having were normal. And it wasn't just me, it was this voice in my head, which everyone has, but just being able to name it and kind of almost visualize it helped me make those emotions I was feeling kind of the day before the race more, more manageable. That's what he said about his chimp. You know, he came back to the group the night before the race and he said, look guys, I'm really nervous. I'm feeling apprehensive. I'm kind of not feeling myself. And it, it kind of opened Pandora's box. We all kind of said, look mate, we're the same. You know, we're all feeling nervous. We're all feeling scared. We're all feeling apprehensive. And kind of having that level of honesty with each other kind of really helped us support support each other during, during that time. Um, and it was the same throughout the race, really. At times, we, you know, we all struggled. We all had our really bad days, but by being an open, honest team, it, it seemed to really, really help us. One of the coping mechanisms both Tom and I used was this talking in the third person. So whenever it was kind of like our shift or we didn't want to go out and kind of row or we were feeling down, it would always be, Ollie, come on, pull yourself together, get out there. Ollie, don't let your mate down. Come on, Ollie, just put your clothes on. And, and honestly, it sounds crazy. A lot of people ask us what kind of simple coping mechanisms we have. That was probably the big standout, talking to yourself in the third person.